and this is Astral Soul Lightning, a podcast about making meaning through mythology, synchronicity, and the cosmos, understanding the world and what it means to be human through a wider lens. Quote, we cracked the code, NM28-30, new moon, 28th to 30th, end of the month, said the crime scene investigator. No light here or Havana. <laughs> Perfect for smuggling, said her partner, end quote. A scene from CSI Miami first season I happened to be watching late one night. I'm a little obsessed with crime thrillers, especially of the psychological nature. Known for its power potential, the new moon is a moment where action is favored. But what mischief? can happen under the darkness of the new moon. Imagination kicks in at this point. The National Military Intelligence Foundation's article on the failings of 911 is entitled, A Failure of Imagination in the U.S. Intelligence Community. The first line of the introduction reads as a tombstone. Quote, in its postmortem of the World Trade Center attacks, the 911 Commission report charged the U.S. Intelligence Community, USIC, with failure of imagination, policy capabilities, and management. End quote. From JSTOR.org. No one could imagine planes being used as weapons. Well, one man knew, special assistant to the president, Richard Clark, but he was ignored, then demoted from his cabinet-level position. The nonchalance with which modern society dismisses the intrinsic necessity of human creativity cost our country immeasurably. Caught nakedly unaware, America changed. We invaded the wrong country. We tortured so long ago, but it's retrograde season when humans retrace steps and are forced to remember. Quote, it was a tragedy too, of course, and viewers could not agree which part of it was a tragedy, and that too was a tragedy. It was also a preview of coming attractions. It was the model of the all-in immersion coverage that 24-hour news would apply to everything from wars to missing persons cases to sex scandals. All OJ all the time would seamlessly become all Clinton Lewinsky all the time, complete with legal commentators reprising their roles. End quote. From James, James Panawozik, in the New York Times. The past roars back. There are eight phases of the moon. The waxing crescent moon on June 12, 1994, was in its first phase. On this date, the visibility of our moon would have been at 10%. It's why many astrologers say to wait until the second or third day to launch or start something new. But on this night... There came a hunter. Los Angeles exploded with the news that Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were slaughtered in the dead of night. The woman's body, the blood, all pointed to a bloodthirsty, enraged attacker. One suspect rose in the dawn, her ex-husband, O.J. Simpson. Tried and found innocent, there is a myth that no one paid the price. It's true. After the acquittal, there was never another person charged with the gruesome murders. The acquittal I watched in the uh, community room of the L.A. Weekly where I worked. There are always warnings. But who would have thought it would happen to them? Nicole Brown Simpson was seen regularly in Brentwood with her sunglasses on, her kids tagging along. But underneath, she was hiding bruises on her face. The L.A. gossip scene was rife with tales of the couple's unwinding. Reported fights had brought police to Nicole's door on more than one occasion. When the storybook 
lovers ended. Simpson couldn't accept he had no control over her. When a man shows you who he is, believe him. When he says he'll change, he's lying. The evils of man lead, to a, lead us to a story out of Arizona via Jezebel.com. Quote, On Tuesday, the Arizona Supreme Court upheld an abortion ban passed in 1864 when Arizona was still a territory, not a state. Arizonans have been living under a 15-week ban since December 2022, but this new ruling prohibits abortions at any gestation unless done to save the life of the pregnant person. Abortion providers could face up to five years in prison for violating the law, which could limit the number of people willing to perform an emergency abortion, end quote. We are fighting for our lives today as elected officials turn back to 1864 to finish the job on women started long ago. When someone like Trump tells you that punishment is due for women who obtain abortions, believe him. The Handmaid's Tale on Netflix is barely fiction anymore. From Margaret Atwood in 2017 in the New York Times via QZ.com, quote, The control of women and babies has been a feature of every repressive regime on the planet, she wrote. Without women capable of giving birth, human populations would die out. That is why. The mass rape and murder of women, girls, and children has long been a feature of genocidal wars and of other campaigns meant to subdue and exploit a population, end quote. Reading further down the page, another quote from Atwood, this one from Reddit via QZ.com, quote, One of my rules for writing The Handmaid's Tale was that I would not put anything into it that had not happened in human history or for which we did not already have the tools. I was drawing upon some very discouraging chapters in the human story. Having been born in 1939 and therefore having been a small child during the war, I was aware of the suddenness with which Things we think are stable can change for the worse. So I have never thought it can't happen here. End quote. Nicole Brown Simpson tried to make the police understand over and over, but OJ was a celebrity, celebrity and former NFL star. It was a change in his trial's venue from Brentwood, where O.J. lived among white America who had embraced him, and near where the murders took place to downtown Los Angeles that made the difference. As O.J. used to say, quote, I'm not black, I'm O.J., end quote. Today there are warnings going off about the country in which we live. There is a minority attempting to overthrow the majority to make the United States something we were not intended to be by the framers. Awful things happen to good people when they're not paying attention to all the signs. As a thriller writer, I'm predisposed to explore the mental failings of humans and what our mania can drive us to commit. I've studied the mind and how it mutates to produce psychopathic people. Los Angeles is a fascinating metropolis and a people magnet. The city changed the trajectory of my life and revealed my soul's code, but not before the broken places I'd ignored were exposed to the bone on the way to discovering a gift for gore I'd tap years later. The quote-unquote literature of witness is how Margaret Atwood describes her writing. This is a wide category I've learned. As you've like, likely seen in watching or reading The Handmaid's Tale, Atwood never saw the details of what she wrote about. Her imagination took what she'd witnessed, extrapolated the horror, and transplanted the emotional trauma 
into a fictional world. Too many Americans are sleepwalking into a cataclysmic moment because they don't believe it can happen here. Like Atwood, there are news stories that stick with you when you're a kid. I was 12 when a serial killer's four and one half hour rampage shattered America's innocence. From NBC News on the 50th anniversary of the first of its kind attack back in 2016. His name was Richard Speck, and the details of his legendary crime imprinted on my mind forever. Quote, it really was the first random mass murder of the 20th century, he continued. It really was the end of an age of innocence. It changed everything. We all became much more conscious of our security. Eight nurses could be slaughtered in their beds for no reason by a stranger, end quote. I'm going to read from uh, Maybe Fatal, a book I wrote and published and was published in 2018 called one of the buzziest books of February that year. This is my literature of witness. No one saw him. He made certain. It had been two months since Raymond Drake's last indulgence. He disciplined himself, waited, but his fantasies weren't enough. Tried to survive on the thrills inside his mind, couldn't anymore. Had eyes on the front of her office building before anyone came in, watched people enter, delighted in their ignorance of what would come. Felt their surprise deep in his gut as the pure pleasure of the fantasy played in his mind. Held his excitement at bay. She arrived in a sunflower yellow pantsuit. Virgin white blouse made him snicker. Four-inch cobalt blue strappy sandals. Her chestnut brown hair bounced at her so shoulders. Long sterling silver wavy drop earrings dangled from each ear and peeked in and out of the strands of her long locks. Streaks of red highlights flashed in the morning sunlight. Oh, to grab her hair, bend her to my will. Dressed in black, workout clothes formed to fit his physique, the leather jacket bulked up his frame to a formidable presence. No one would glean a hint of viciousness. It was good to be handsome, unattached, a man with straight white teeth, his manicure flawless, lace-up leather boots, no detail too small. No one would suspect him. Cunning was the initial wound delivered with a smile. Before she blinked twice, strike. Thoughts of it aroused him. It began, a gurgle of euphoria. Visualization of her face, how it, be, how it would be when he had her. In his grasp, to watch her lose her will. Sublime surrender, he would set her free, deliver peace to her. Unlike previous Thursdays, she'd exited the building alone at 7.11 p.m. Raymond had seen her colleagues leave earlier. They'd scheduled drinks at an upscale bar, the same time each of the last three weeks. But today she walked off alone to the employee parking lot next door. A sign. He followed unnoticed. The lateness of the hour buoyed him. On her phone, oblivious... She hadn't seen the tall, handsome man enter the garage, had missed the quickened pace of his steps. She laughed in her own world. Raymond Drake smiled, followed his prey. Better for him if he took her happy, but he must not catch her in the middle of the conversation. Goodbye was the signal. He would purchase the look he craved through force, terror to replace her uplifted mood. The instant she realized her mistake, the look in her eyes, what he craved. 
Thoughts of it increased his breathing, quickened his pace, a whiff of her, wanted to stop and save her. Fierce need propelled him. They were alone. Behind her, closer, three, two. It happened in slow motion in his mind, Raymond's hand over her mouth. She seized up. His strength lifted her off off the earth. Midair, he beheld the moment. Eyes wide, her mouth agape, shock, no power to protest. Slammed down on the hood of her car, their eyes locked. She scooted backward. He grabbed her legs, pulled, straddled the beauty below him, towered over her. She lay still. Silent terror spread across her face. The blade in his hand, fingers to his lips. Shh, I want to play with you. Her face scrunched together, defenseless. She'd allowed herself to get distracted. Tears dropped down her cheeks. Savor each second this delicious fight, the moment of collapse. She would be his. A pitiful whimper. Shh. His teeth gleamed, bright eyes. A smile from ear to ear. Grunts, groans. She shook her head no. Oh, yes. The roundhouse right hook landed with a crack. Raymond watched her slide off the car to the concrete. Head tilted, pursed lips, his victim lay at his feet. Beautiful girl. Checked his surroundings, nothing moved, all quiet, leaned down, turned the woman's head, whipped out a knife from his belt, slashed at a section of hair near her scalp. A flick of his wrist caught flesh. The wound began to drip, drip, drip. A swipe of his index finger over the red droplets, the taste of her, not her sex, but the flow of life itself. Eyes closed. The ritual he savored, euphoric moments when he proved to be invincible. The tune in Raymond's head came across his lips in a shallow whisper. The, the thrill simmered inside him, his rigid member strangled against his pants. In the moment of triumph, Raymond Drake believed no one caught him because his mission was divine. Didn't stop to secure his own safety. Over his shoulder, a fireman's carry. He must be quick, his car nearby. Opened the trunk, extracted the needle from his bag, plunged it into her thigh, enough ketamine to knock her out for the drive. She'd not awaken until he reached the far edge of Maryland's eastern shore. No one worries about a stranger who looks like a Hollywood star and drives a classic sports car. But experts agree white males commit most deviant sexual crimes. It starts with a fantasy. It ends in actualized terror. A quote from Einstein. I'm enough of an artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. End quote. On April 15th, Donald J. Trump will face a criminal trial with the jury being selected on this date. It's called the hush money trial, but that only scratches the surface. The unvarnished truth is, before the 2016 presidential election, Trump, with the help of his men, paid off women to keep his womanizing secret from voters. The details include... Names like Stormy Daniels, De, uh, a, playbo a Playboy Bunny, and the National Enquirer, and Michael Cohen. As a presidential candidate, Trump couldn't allow the truth to come out before the election for fear voters would find out how he treated women, including his pregnant wife, Melania. Election interference through hush money payments. People call it, are calling this a less serious trial than the classified documents indictment. But nothing is more understandable for voters than a man paying off someone to keep the serial mistreatment of women secret 
so he could win the presidency. This is true crime, the evil of one man helped by other men, and the lack of imagination of the American voter who once handed a liar the presidency, who thinks he can get away with his evil again. Michael Cohen added an important tidbit in an interview with Politico's Ryan Lizza this week, quote, They are going to pull out every stop they can to try to demonstrate to the judge that they cannot get a fair jury, that they cannot get a fair trial here in New York, end quote. Trump fooled America once, as O.J. Simpson did long ago. But as we learned with E. Jean Carroll, justice is possible if you don't give up. I'm Taylor Marsh. And you've been listening to Astral Soul Lightning. You can find out more about me at taylormarsh.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time.